Okay, good evening everyone. We're gonna get started here. So wherever you're at, if you wanna come up and get cozy, you're welcome to have a seat. Um, but welcome everyone. This is the last and final session of the Drugs in Youth, What Adults Need to Know mini series. My name is Rachel Abaza. I'm a public health nurse at the Brant County Health Unit and project lead for the mini series. I wanna say thank you for everyone coming and if it's your first time joining, welcome and a warm welcome to everyone at home too. I'd like to take a moment to offer a land acknowledgement. Here at the Civic Center, we're on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Brantford is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to six nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We would like to acknowledge the resilience of the Six Nations communities that have lived, loved, and remained here forever. As adults, we're here tonight to learn and educate ourselves. This will help support and nurture our children and youth in positive ways to build resilience and heal from issues associated with substance use in our community. Okay, so tonight's session is titled Community Supports. It's slightly different from our past four sessions, but we're connecting all the dots from what we have learned, and we're getting into speaking about what's going on locally. We have representatives from various organizations in Brantford and Brant County here with us tonight, um, where they'll share resources and supports and where to get a start now that you have learned all these new knowledge and skills. Unfortunately tonight, Dr. Bruno is not here, so I'm going to do my best to try to fill her shoes to give us a little mini recap of what we've been over in the past four series, um, but just, just bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm not Dr. Tara Bruno. <laughs> um, but I am excited to welcome back Maria Estrada, who's sitting here at the front here, and she will conclude our session for tonight. I hope you all had a chance to browse the marketplace booths, speaking to our community representatives. If you didn't have the chance, we're going to reopen the uh, booths at the end of the session. And we're not doing our formal Q&A um, like we normally do at the end. So if you do have any specific questions for any of our representatives, please feel free to chat with them at the end of the session tonight. Um, in your registration packages, you'll see a resource guide. Um, this was developed by compiling resources from sessions one to four, shared from Dr. Tara Bruno and Maria, um, and also our marketplace vendors. It also has resources that are divided up locally, provincially, national, and international uh, regions um, that have different contact information. You'll also see a section that has mobile apps that maybe you or the youth that you engage with would benefit from. Um, there's also, um, if you, we'll also send out an electronic copy um, to those of you that provide your email during registration and for those of you that are virtual. So just look out in your inboxes in the next little bit and we'll have that copy sent to you. Uh, well, there's also an evaluation package in your registration forms so uh, if you do have time at the end of this session it'd be great to hear your feedback and it is anonymous okay so now for me being uh, dr bruno here <laughs> okay so looking back at session one um, both dr tara bruno and maria estrada shared a bit about themselves their histories their expertise and why they're doing this work they more formally introduced the biopsychosocial so model as the necessary multi-dimensional foundation for understanding and responding to substance use this model and more recent work on trauma and resilience represents a paradigm shift away from individualized and medicalized approaches to substance use and addiction and focuses more on a holistic approach that takes into account the complex interplay between the individual, the mind, and social conditions. The continuum of substance use was then introduced where we learned that not all use is considered equal. There are different levels of risk and potential harms based on frequency and quantity of use, but there are also different le levels of risk and harms based on individual and social reasons for using. The message from Dr. Bruno and Maria was that we need to think about the reasons and not just the pattern or drug use on the continuum. Everyone's path is unique and we need to accept that and provide ways of supporting people that are unique to them and their reasons for using. 
uh, ending session one, we learned that in order to address any forms of substance use, it's important to examine the basics of building a foundation for healthy relationships, belonging, and connection. Families are an important social institution for children and youth that should feel a sense of belonging and connection. Parents are centrally important in this, and so too are other adults in the community. Building upon the foundation of the biopsychosocial model and the continuum of use, in the second session, Dr. Bruno and Maria reviewed the different types of substances, as well as some of the basic uh, effects on the brain, and then we discussed some substance use literacy. For example, that substance use is not the same as substance use disorder, which isn't the same as addiction. One of the key messages was to start talking early, in age-appropriate ways, and ideally before substances become normal or intriguing. We can't just expect that individuals will figure it out and thrive. Some may be able to, but it's much easier and effective if we're all doing the work to help build resilience in our youth. The wonderful thing that Dr. Bruno and Maria shared about resilience is that it can be taught at any age and it rests on some innate or rugged qualities that we have in our youth. What in, what's important to remember is that in order for an in, individual to be resilient, we need to think about how we can make these resources, expectations, and opportunities more widely available and for them to better navigate and negotiate through their experiences. So moving to session three, that's when we spoke in depth about early identification and interventions. Dr. Bruno shared different youth assessments, the DSM criteria, signs and symptoms of use, and how and when to have the conversation. However, there can be barriers to early identification and intervention for those that are trying to support the people who use substances, as they may ex experience something called secondary stigma, which we learned is when people that are connected to the stigmatized individual are judged or stereotyped just by association. Stigma in many forms often prevents people from reaching out and getting support, and that includes people who are trying to support someone who does have substance use issues. So it's vitally important that family members, friends, or other support people also prioritize their own health and well-being and exercise those self-care activities, especially while supporting someone who is struggling with substance use. In the last session, we had Maria provide us with, a knowledge, with knowledge about various treatment modalities. There are two great videos she shared talking about uh, sympathy versus empathy and an overview of harm reduction. Maria emphasized that there is not one recipe, as I like to call it, for a treatment pathway that works for everyone. And getting that person to start treatment is also dependent on their readiness for change. Maria reminded us that there are various states of change and that the recovery period is simply not one week or one month and their treatment is simply finished. Rather, it's a journey of being the strongest version of themselves and a journey that's not done alone. So to come full circle for what we have learned and gained over the past four sessions from Dr. Bruno and Maria, we need to share with you tonight what resources and community partners that are here in our own backyards have to help you navigate and seek professional support for yourself or the youth that you are engaging with and trying to help. We have various representatives listed here on the slide that are passionate and dedicated to supporting the community in ways to address the harms of substances, substance youth, use in youth. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker of the night, Alyssa Stryker, and Alyssa is the Drug Strategy Coordinator of the Brantford Brant Drug Strategy. So a warm welcome for Alyssa. How do I advance this slide? Just oh, there, yeah. Giant arrow. Yeah. Cool. Can everybody hear me? Is that sounding good? All right, well, it's wonderful to be here tonight and to meet you all. Um, like Rachel said, I am Alyssa Stryker. I'm the Drug Strategy Coordinator for Brantford and Brant County. I'm based at the Brant County Health Unit, but much of my work is with a coalition of community partners um, who form the Brantford Brant Community Drug Strategy. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them, a little bit more about them um, in a second. So I've been in this role um, about nine months. So. 
not brand new, but I'm pretty new. Um, but I'm excited to give you a little bit of an overview of where the drug strategy has come from before I started and where we're looking to go in the future. So what is the drug strategy? The drug strategy began in 2016 and recognized that um, the community needed to address issues related to drug use um, as a coalition. No one organization could sort of do it on their own. Everybody wanted to kind of get around the same table and talk about these issues that were challenging the community at that time. So to develop the initial drug strategy, nearly 200 individuals were consulted, including 50 youth ages 11 to 25, 40 individuals with lived experience of drug use or addiction, nearly 70 employees from 13 local service organizations, 77 respondents to electronic surveys, which um, solicited input from additional service providers as well as the Brantford Police. And all of these folks got together and they developed the Brantford Brant Community Drug Strategy. So this document is available online. Um, the link is there. I realize you can't click on it on the screen, but um, if you have any trouble finding it, um, very easy to Google or feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to send you a copy. So that's a, that's a document that contains 38 recommendations that this large group of folks decided would help address um, drug-related issues in the community. So after that big group did their work, developed this initial drug strategy, a smaller group of organizations um, kind of took on the project of meeting in an ongoing way to implement um, these recommendations that were identified at that time. And that group of organizations um, constitutes the, the drug strategy. So what does the drug strategy actually look like? Um, like I said, the drug strategy started in 2016, 2017, and since that time, um, the structure has kind of evolved as time has passed, but this is what the drug strategy looks like today. So we have our um, Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee, which is a core group of um, 10 organizations. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them in a second. Um, and that group meets monthly. It's sort of the governing body of the drug strategy. And it also works alongside um, a number of working groups. There are more than just three, but um, I didn't want to overcrowd this slide. Um, so between the, the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee and those working groups that take on sort of specific projects or work on specific areas, that, that's the, the structure of the drug strategy. And as the Drug Strategy Coordinator, it's my job to kind of facilitate collaboration, help with logistics, chair meetings, um, develop agendas, make sure that, that the work of this group proceeds um, as smoothly as possible. So who's on the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee? Many of the organizations are actually involved in this series, which is wonderful, and I'm not gonna go into detail about their work since um, they can tell you about it better than I can, but the core members of the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee include um, the City of Brantford, the County of Brant, the Brant County Health Unit, the Brantford Substance Users Network, the Brant Community Health Care System, the AIDS Network, Grand River Community Health Center, Woodview Mental Health and Autism Services, the Brantford Police, and St. Leonard's Community Services. Um, so that's our core team of 10. And alongside that group, we have um, a number of advisory members or partners who sometimes participate in meetings, advise the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee, et cetera. Um, and I just listed a few of them there to give you a flavor. So some of them include the Six Nations Integrated Drug Strategy Coordinator, um, the Mental Health and Addiction Steering Committee of the Ontario Health Team, uh, the Laurier Brantford Campus, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the um, Brant Brantford Paramedic Services. So what do these folks actually do? At a high level, the role of this group is to implement the um, Brantford Brant Community Drug Strategy. So again, that's the 38 recommendations that I mentioned um, initially. Of course, you can't pursue 38 recommendations at the same time. So within those 38 recommendations, it's the role of the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee to um, kind of prioritize, identify which of those recommendations meet the most urgent needs in the community, identify which of those are feasible, what do we have the resources to implement, and really identify very specific interventions that can um, achieve the, the goals that were laid out in that drug strategy. 
And again, a lot of that work takes place through those working groups that I mentioned. So the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee will identify a priority or a project, and a working group will be created to actually undertake that work. So in addition to um, kind of implementing those recommendations, the drug strategy also provides a forum for ongoing conversation and collaboration among local organizations who are working on drug-related issues. So you know, it brings everybody together once a month. It allows people to raise pressing issues, challenges that they're seeing, um, ask questions, learn about new initiatives that other organizations are taking on, and really allow organizations to um, have that forum for conversation regularly, and you know, so they can be sure that everybody is, is working together smoothly. Um, in addition, as the drug strategy coordinator, um, I like to think of myself as a first point of contact um, for the community talk to talk about drug-related challenges, gaps in services, um, that kind of thing. Really just to ask any questions about drug-related work going on in the community. I, I may not have the answer, but I will probably know who to ask to find it. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to me. I'll share my email at the end. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I really see myself um, in this role as accountable to the community, and I want to be responsive to challenges that, that you're finding if, if you're trying to navigate the system, if you're seeking services for a loved one, that kind of thing thing. Um, so very briefly, I thought I'd highlight a couple of activities that the drug strategy is currently um, undertaking that are specifically related to youth. Um, over the last few months, the coordinating committee has been finalizing a 2023 action plan, and we're anticipating that that will be released publicly in um, early 2023, likely early February. Um, so unfortunately, I can't share the whole plan with you tonight, but I did want to highlight um, two youth-specific initiatives. So the first is um, implementing or scaling up the Preventure program, which is led by uh, Woodview Mental Health and Autism Services, and I believe we'll hear from them later in the evening, so perhaps you'll get to hear more about it then. Um, I'll leave it there because, uh, like you said, they, they would be much better to fill in the details there than I. And then the other initiative is uh, the, the drug strategy is, is planning to convene a youth wellness working group. And the goal of that group will be assess, assessing existing work happening in the community and identify gaps that need to be filled. And then after that, that working group will aim to develop a plan to fill those gaps. So this working group came out of a recognition from the Drug Strategy Coordinating Committee that we wanted to engage more on youth specific issues, but that we didn't have a clear idea of exactly how we could um, kind of bring the most benefit or make the most difference. So we thought that doing some listening and some learning and, and trying to figure out sort of where the gaps are that are, are most urgent and, and where we could, um, you know, make the biggest difference was an appropriate starting point, and we're hoping to get that started in 2023. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, I know that this was uh, kind of high level and probably uh, not that interesting when it comes to like on the ground services, but hopefully it's given like a bit of a framework for understanding how all of the wonderful organizations who are providing those on the ground services kind of work together, talk together, um, think about problem solving behind the scenes and really try to address these issues um, kind of from the level of the whole community. And I think that, that that's the real strength of the drug strategy is that we sort of have these conversations um, as a group and, and think across the whole system about you know, what we're missing, what we're doing well, and, and where we could improve. And um, I'm really lucky to get to facilitate that process. So like I said, that's my email. Take a picture. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Seriously, please email me if, if you have any questions or um, yeah, you want to follow up on anything you heard. But um, I'll leave it there for now and turn you back over to Rachel. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. That was fabulous. Um, next up, we'd like to welcome up May Mayor David Bailey from the County of Brant. Well, first of all, I'd like to bring greetings from my council, the County of Brant. Um, Mayor Davis is here tonight. He didn't know if he was going to be able to make it or not, but he's here, so I hope we've left him room to speak to uh, this evening. Um, although I wasn't really part of all the different stages of this program, um, 
I do understand the process that you went through and how we got to tonight. Tonight is the part of the program or the, the uh, facts gathering, information gathering. That's a little bit of a bright spot because at least we have results. We have encouraging results. I don't think the County of Brant and the City of Brantford have ever been closer uh, in sharing their resources uh, and, and recognizing a situation or a problem. And the nice thing about being the mayor of, of um, of the County of Brand is I get to talk to all my neighbors and we are not unique in this problem and this the situation of, of needing to I mean it's very sad to have to put together a, a, a drug strategy but we're not alone in, in that process uh, our neighbors in Cambridge and Woodstock and, and other people smaller people around us uh, have all had to do it too and they're not quite as up-to-date as we are at least we came out of the gate quick and effectively, and I look around the room at the people that are represented here tonight, and we're very lucky to have you people as players in the solutions to our drug strategy. Um, because Brantford really does take the lead on social services with the County of Brant, uh, I, I'm sure that Mayor Davis can speak to the details more than I can, because we do, uh, again, the, the trick of being a good mayor is letting everyone who does their job very well do their job. And uh, this is uh, just a piece of what I do. Uh, but I know that we've, we've kept our eye on it. And our, our, uh, we're very happy. I, I sit on the OPP board, too. And I know that our, our OPP um, uh, players are also at the table. So we have all kinds of things that we do with people that we, um, that we have to deal with, with drug addictions and, and people that are in distress. And you know, I don't know about the city, but the county tries to keep people out of the courts as much as we can. We try to intercept people. And, and I don't think that anyone uh, should have to have a record follow them for one bad decision on a Saturday night. And so I, I do have a process in the county where I like to keep um, incidents um, clear from prosecution if we can because I mean everyone can have a bad a bad night or a bad weekend um, that's how I feel personally I can't speak on behalf of my council on that issue but it's the way I feel um, but I do feel very confident in the fact that Bramford has taken the lead on this uh, and when I look at when I look at Cambridge and I look at Woodstock and I look at Hamilton um, I know I know that everything seems worse at home and when I say home I mean the county of Brand and Bramford but our problems um, could be worse uh, they're worse very close to us and and they, as I said they haven't they haven't um, put things in place right right out of the gate like we have we're in very good shape um, even if things get better for us quickly, uh, we have we have systems now in place with all the all the players that are in this room to never have to worry about falling back uh, and being behind again. So we're we're going to be ahead of the game. I hope that when we start talking about safe injection sites, we can all agree on where they should be too, because I know there's all kinds of different ideas of where they should be. I personally think they should be as close to the people as they can be. I don't think that they're ever to be put in um, industrial parks or uh, commercial settings. I think to wrap around services, you have to have people be able to find the services. And I know um, that the mayor, a mayor very close to us, lost her election because she would not, she's a nurse, and she would not change her mind on where she thought the safe injection site should be. And I know there's a couple of health units very close to us that are very nervous now of what's going to happen to their um, to their health care system because um, uh, the, the new mayor thinks that uh, the services shouldn't be visible. And I think that's a big mistake. So I'm hoping when Kevin and I can get together on what we, we think should happen to safe injection sites through the health unit and other agencies that we can agree that they should be, um, they should be visible and they should... Uh, they should be easy to find the services to wrap around all of the drug addictions and all the homelessness. So thank you for inviting me here tonight. And thank you for all being partners and stepping up for the challenge. I know it's a terrible challenge, but out of everything terrible comes great solutions and great uh, programming. So thank you very much. And I, uh, I guess tonight's session is over, but I think we have great results and great statistics. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor Bailey. 
Um, well, you know, he did kind of spark some, some conversation and, and Mayor Davis, you are here tonight. So I, I think it would be great to have you kind of come up and speak if you, if you would love to. We do have one of your representatives from, from the city speaking after you. So if you do have a few words, you definitely can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing fine and enjoying this uh, very useful series. I've been able to get to one or two of the previous um, events that have been taking part as, as part of this series. So it's interesting when it comes to uh, an important social issue that our community, as many do across North America, you know, the, the drug crisis, the opioid crisis, mental health crisis. And so uh, people will look to a mayor and say, what are you doing to solve this problem? And my response is that we solve the problem. It's not one person. It's not one organization. It's different organizations, different people coming together and doing what they each do best to address the problem. And, or the, let's call it the challenge. And so I came into office four or five years ago and I will admit I knew pretty much nothing. I mean, I had personal experience with alcoholics in my life and uh, helped two of them recover. I was my best friend and my mother, actually. So I, had the, I, knew, I knew about a, um, addiction from that perspective. But it certainly was a real wake-up call for me. And at first I felt, when I realized the scale of the problem, I was feeling kind of powerless, like, what, what can I do? And I, what I quickly realized was this issue of partnerships. And so I came to know the organizations in our community like St. Leonard's, like Woodview, like CMHC, the Survivors Group, the Brand County Health Unit. And I realized that my role as a mayor was, is to advocate, encourage, try and bring a spotlight on where it is that we have the need in our community. And so for example, this, the issue of a safe consumption site. Uh, I realized early on that it uh, was something that, uh, that our community did not have and could have, but the community would have to come behind it because if the community doesn't want it, the community doesn't get it. And so, for example, I've toured the safe consumption site in Guelph three times, uh, the one in London twice, and I've actually taken uh, the previous council, all the members of council, and other leaders in the community to Guelph actually, which has a great uh, tour program. So that people can understand what it is that makes a safe consumption site successful and what does not make it successful. And so that was a role for me as mayor, where I was helping other people kind of tr come to the level of understanding that, that I'd gotten to with the help of other people in the community. And then I realized that um, and so this is what America can do. Americans, you know, you see gaps in our drug strategy, and we saw that uh, this drug community drug strategy, a lot of different groups doing things, wasn't that well coordinated. And so myself and Mayor Bailey and other members of the public health board, we pushed the health unit to fund it. And we agreed at the city council and the county brand to help fund that. And as a result, we have Alyssa, who's doing a great job helping us coordinate and improve our coordinated drug strategy. And then I realized that uh, we don't have a drug treatment court here in Brantford. I'm a lawyer by background. I know the Crown attorneys and the judges and many of the lawyers. And I thought, you know, this is something that I can help with. And so I did help the group that has been formed get off the ground, and I help them where I can. Uh, hopefully we will have uh, a drug treatment court here modeled after the one in Hamilton sometime soon. Then I also realized another thing that a mayor can do in politicians is accessing money from the province, because so many of the programs that you see on the ground dealing with mental health issues or substance abuse, the money for it 
and the, the design of the programs comes from either the province or the federal government. So what AMER can help a city do and the organizations in the city is connect into those programs. And so some of what uh, I've done and what we've done at City Council is help St. Leonard's access uh, some of the programs and grants that are available through the provincial government. Then I, I realized that you know, our drug strategy where you have like the health unit, they're doing a lot in terms of keeping track of the data. Uh, they dispense needles in the needle exchange program, so that's, that's harm prevention or reduction. Of course, we have St. Leonard's, all the various programs they run when it comes to rehab and uh, treatment, the Grand River Community Health Center, the Rapid Access uh, Clinic. But then I realized, hmm, we're kind of missing a piece here, and it's helping youth the youth of our community uh, be better able to handle the stresses of life and growing up and knowing the healthy ways to deal with all the challenges you have as a teenager and growing into an adult and not falling into the habit which then becomes an addiction of the drug of choice. And I did a lot of reading and I realized that many times when you talk, when you hear people tell their life story of substance use, it usually begins in their youth. And so began to talk that up. Uh, we now, as you've heard, in our drug strategy, we're really trying to build up the youth prevention program. Uh, Woodview does a great program called Preventure. It's actually designed by a psychiatrist in Montreal, University of Montreal. It's gained international recognition as a very effective program for recognizing What's the, the beauty of it is you identify the traits, that's actually a, a personality traits, in young people, teenagers, that predispose them, make them susceptible to developing substance use uh, problems. And you try and get at it and help them before they develop a substance use issue. And I was really pleased to hear that uh, Woodview was actually years ahead of me on that. And so, as a mayor, I'm trying to help them and connect them into the programs <clears throat> that we run the city. And so then you may ask me, okay, what does this city do? And you gotta realize that a city is not a province. It doesn't have responsibility for medical uh, problems or issues or mental health. But what we do at the city is we are very much involved in housing and working with uh, the county. We have a really uh, much expanded affordable housing program and we're now moving into, and we've been doing what's called supportive housing. So uh, we actually have a supportive housing unit in Eagle Place, where many of the people that are staying there actually came right from tent cities. And they have support services in place to deal with substance use, mental health, life skills, and it's our partners that are providing that. St. Leonard's does a lot of the programming there. Uh, you may have heard we, we've just bought a building from Laurier that over the winter we're gonna be converting into at least 50 units. And that won't be fully supportive housing, but it'll have a supportive component. And who's gonna be providing those supports? Our partners, Woodview, Grand River Community Health Center, St. Leonard's. And so that's the last point I'd like to make, which is if we think someone has the answer, and someone's gonna fix the problem. Uh, and I think most of us here know that's not the case, that's not gonna happen. It's a, it's, a, it's a complex problem. It requires a consistent response that's organized with the help of people like Alyssa and all the organizations, and you just can't let up. It's, it's day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. As a community, you look at what can we do better? What are other communities doing that works better than what we're doing? So you continually work towards improving it. And over the course of time, you hope that the, that the problem is less severe. And I mean, that, that keeps you going, right? You can't, you can't lose hope. You gotta believe that the things we're doing now as a community in a better coordinated way with more funding and attention from the province and the federal government, that, that we are over the course of time going to improve the situation in our community and improve the lives of those in our community who are impacted by substance use issues. So I remain optimistic, I remain hopeful, because I know our community can work together 
And that's the key, all of us working together to help address this issue because there's no other way we can solve it other than by working together. So, I know I was rambling there a little bit, but I was trying to tell you off the top of my head um, what I think about the drug situation, in particular youth in particular, and because um, that's what this series has been focused on, is how we help youth. And, and it's been, I think, very useful for me, a lot of the information I've learned here in the last couple of weeks, um, which I will use in the future. But uh, again, I thank the organizers for doing this. It's been very helpful, I'm sure, to a number of people, and certainly not least of which myself. So, thanks very much. Okay, thank you so much. I know that was impromptu, but great information shared. Um, we do have another representative from the city of Brantford. Uh, her name is Victoria Boyle. Victoria is representing this, uh, the city of Brantford as the project coordinator for the city's housing stability department. She's presenting virtually, so we're just gonna do a quick little um, IT switch up here and, and get her to share her screen, okay? So my name is Victoria Boyle. I'm a project coordinator with the Housing Stability Department at the City of Brantford. Um, so in my role, I oversee the coordinated access system for homelessness services locally, and I work closely with our community partners to make sure that people can access the services they need. So essentially, it's my job to support the connectedness of our system, identify and bridge gaps that exist, and support service providers to work together effectively. Um, my email is up on the screen, so please don't hesitate to connect with me if you have any questions about homelessness services. And unlike some of the other presenters today, um, I am just going to be talking a little bit about youth homelessness, not so much um, drug related, but homelessness. And I will be quite brief um, so we can get back to um, the drug related programming here. Uh, so I first just wanted to provide some background about youth homelessness in Brantford. So I'll start by briefly sharing a couple of statistics. So the point in time count is a survey that counts the number of people experiencing homelessness locally. Um, so during the 2021 count, there was 156 people that participated and 5% of respondents were 18 and under. Um, but the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness defines youth as ages 12 to 24, and the number of youth under 24 who responded to the survey was closer to 14%, and so that's about 23 individuals who identified that they were experiencing homelessness out of the 156 um, and our youth. Um, another bit of information is we do also have a by name list locally, which is a real time list of individuals experiencing homelessness in Brantford Brant, and it counts approximately 12 individuals 18 and under who have accessed services within the last three months. Um, but if you look for individuals 24 and under that number would be closer to 60 people who have accessed services from our homelessness system in the last three months. And I also wanted to note that youth are a prioritized group on our list for being matched with services, which basically just means that youth um, are a priority for accessing services and making sure that they're supported. Uh, so one last piece of data that I wanted to share that came out of the point in time count is that 35% um, of individuals who are currently experiencing homelessness were first homeless before the age of 18 and 45% were first homeless before the age of 25. So this information is really crucial. It tells us how important early diversion and homelessness prevention is, especially for youth, seeing how many young people, um, seeing how many people first experienced homelessness as a youth and rather than in adulthood. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm just going to share a little bit of information about some of these services that youth are able to access um, if they are at risk of or experiencing homelessness. So the first is the Salvation Army Housing Resource Center, also known as the HRC. Uh, so the HRC acts as a hub for housing services in Brantford. They provide those diversion services that I mentioned. They also provide trusteeship and fi financial management programming for youth, housing case management to assist with long-term rental, and housing planning. 
They have an ID clinic, and they also administer funding called the Housing Stability Fund, which provides things like last month's rent, rental arrears, um, if you're in arrears, and other one-time housing-related expenses. They also assist with referrals to emergency shelters for anybody who is in need of a place to stay, including youth. Um, so for youth who do need a place to stay, uh, the city supports two emergency shelters, Station House and Cornerstone. Both are operated by St. Leonard's Community Services, which I know that uh, somebody from St. Leonard's will be speaking here today, so I don't want to overlap, so I'll be quite brief in case this information is shared as well. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share that Station House provides temporary short-term emergency housing um, for youth ages 15 to 17. Cornerstone supports ages 18 to 29. And so while in shelter, staff provide a wide variety of supports to youth um, to obtain and ultimately maintain housing once it's obtained. Um, and they also operate a transitional housing program through Cornerstone as well to kind of be on that housing continuum of supporting people with obtaining housing. Uh, so finally, the Why Not Youth Center is another great support for youth. They provide a drop-in space for youth and supports like mentorship, life skill coaching, and mental health support. They do also have housing supports for individuals who are connected to their programming. And this um, housing support was specifically designed to assist with the local housing crisis that um, we are facing in Brantford for not just youth, but for everyone. And that is all from me. Uh, thank you so much for your time and allowing me to share some information about youth homelessness and the services that can support youth. Um, my contact info is up on the screen again. So if anybody has any questions about homelessness services or supports um, or our system of care, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to discuss. <laughs> Okay, um, next up, we have a familiar face you may have seen on our Q&A pa panel. We have Jackie Boyer uh, from the Grand Erie District School Board that will be representing education. So she's speaking on behalf of Grand Erie and also um, Brant Haldman Norfolk Catholic District School Board. It's always a mouthful for me. <laughs> so please welcome Jackie Boyer. Thank you for introducing both boards because it is a mouthful and now I don't have to do it up here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me here. I want to thank Public Health, uh, Dr. Tara Bruno, Maria Estrada. This has been just a wonderful series. Um, it's been really nice for me to be involved in this and I think one of the things that I have really enjoyed in this series beyond just the knowledge and the learning is the community building and having our community partners here families, access for folks to join from their living rooms online. It's just been a wonderful event. So thank you for uh, having education be a part of this. So I just want to share some thoughts and information on the ways in which the school boards are offering supports to our learners in regards to substance use concerns. Both boards play a pivotal role in substance use prevention and intervention. By the way of the work we do every day in our classrooms and schools, by providing safe, equitable, and welcoming learning environments, we provide the foundations needed for positive mental health. Both boards put a great deal of emphasis in the upstream work of mental health promotion and prevention by not only embedding social-emotional learning in the curriculum, via the educator, but by way of child and youth workers delivering mental health literacy sessions in our grade schools, ensuring students understand what mental health is and what mental health isn't. We help students understand how the brain and body respond to stress and how to mitigate those stressors. And we went through some of that in our five-part series where we learned about ANDs and our nervous systems and how to regulate our nervous systems. We teach healthy ways to cope, which is the upstream work to help mitigate problematic substance use. So by starting at a young age to help folks learn how to deal with their stressors um, is helpful. To be human 
is to suffer. So we have to learn how to get through our suffering in positive ways and learn positive ways to cope with the different situations that life brings at us. Both boards have partnerships with Teaching Intelligent Choices to Kids, which is a board which offers the kids program to grade six students. This program is two-pronged in that students learn about mental health and healthy relationships in the classroom, and then they travel to the safety village where they learn from police officers more content about substance use and of course the law. In grade six, the health and phys ed curriculum addresses the topic of substance use, specifically in the health education. In secondary schools, we provide mental health lit for secondary students. This teaches mental health literacy, signs and symptoms of mental health illness, and how to help yourself and how to help a friend. This program was created through School Mental Health Ontario and is available to schools across the province. Evidence indicates students appreciate learning about mental health in the classroom, and in particular, they really enjoy the model on how to help their friends. Both boards have partnered with Dr. Tara Bruno, who we've had the pleasure to listen to throughout the series. Over the years, she has provided professional development to our staff and have vetted programs being offered to our schools. Most recently, she's been conducting a research project through her university and has engaged students in the both boards in focus groups, asking specifically how they want to learn about substance use and what would help them in regards to substance use. From there, she's helping our boards develop learning tools to assist students in broadening their knowledge base on substance use so they can make better informed choices. We're also using the programming to assist us in alternative to suspensions. So other ways that we can help support students who may have been found to have been involved in substance use infractions at school. It should be noted that across all the curricula, we are encouraging and teaching children to be critical thinkers, to know where to access reliable information and make decisions that make sense to them. Both boards are doing a tremendous amount of work in self-regulation, which again teaches us to identify stressors and learn ways to manage our stress. Where students may need support in addressing their substance youth, use, both boards have social workers who are able to provide therapeutic interventions at school. School Mental Health Ontario, again, has developed professional development opportunities for our regulated mental health professionals so that they are confident and competent in assisting students who have issues with substances by providing best practices. Additionally, both boards have partnership agreements with St. Leonard's Mental Health and Addiction Services, whereby with consent, addiction counselors can see students at our sites. Should a student not be comfortable accessing services on site, both boards assist with helping the student across mental health and addiction services in the community. The mental health and addiction nurses, otherwise known as our MONS nurses, are crucial in providing supports to students at their homes, at school, and in the community. Our educators receive training and supports in noticing signs and symptoms of students in distress. All school boards across the province have been charged to have a mental health and well-being strategy which encompasses addiction supports. We have partnerships with public health to assist us with vaping prevention and substance use up education. And schools play a vital role in recognizing and preventing substance misuse across multiple tiers. We do have many other protocols that intersect with substance use such as anti-bullying, anti-sex trafficking, and violence threat risk assessment protocols. We have equity leads who continue to support our schools in making sure all learners have a sense of acceptance and belonging. We have conducted a student censuses to gain further access to student voice and continue to strive to have healthy and strong partnerships with not only our community supports, but with the families that we serve. Thank you.
Thank you, Jackie. Okay, up next, we, we would like to welcome Lisa Mackay from uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association. Lisa is a facilitator for mental health and promotion and education. So welcome, Lisa. I just flip through your slides, yeah, that one. Thank you. I would like to take a moment too just to thank the people that have put this all together, the speakers, everything. It's truly been an honor of actually being able to participate in this. This is a new role for me. I have been involved in mental health for well over a decade, but this is a new perspective that I've been able to, and I'm enjoying the fact that I'm able to contribute to my community and be able to provide some information. So as Rachel had said, I'm with the Canadian Mental Health Association, Brant Haldeman Norfolk Branch. Uh, otherwise CMHA, BHN, so much easier than that big long title. Our head office and administration office is located at 44 King Street here in Brantford and we also do have a location in Simcoe on Queensway and that's where we have our two branches that we've amalgamated together. So who are we? We are the Canadian Mental Health Association, again, BHN. Um, we are a charitable, nonprofit agency contributing to the mental well being of the community through education, support services to persons with serious illness, mental illness, and their families. We are, are for eligibility for services, it's for 16 years of persons and over. Uh, for residents of Brant, Haldeman, Norfolk counties, and I do receive calls, referrals from outside of this, and we'll help connect. We don't want to leave anybody saying, no, nope, the border stops there. So we provide those connections and the information. Um, and we help people with serious mental illness as well. And it doesn't have to be a diagnosed mental illness. It can be people who are experiencing some sort of alternative reality in their own perspectives. And we are there to help support and to provide those supports to those who are in need. So to access our programs, referrals can be made by intake services. Those can come from hospital, from police, they can come from self-referral. It's completely open. There are no stops on how you're able to access our services. We like to keep the doors open as much as possible. We provide supports and to access those for individuals who can even do a self-referral. Families and friends can refer. Court, probation, doctors, social workers, and all services are voluntary and free and confidential. So our services that we have, there's a huge list here. I'm not going to read them all because I'm going to go through some of the options that we have in the services that we have with CMHA, BHN. This is just the summary. So we have our Brant Safe Beds. I'm not sure if you guys know or have heard of our Brant Safe Beds. This is through the Justice Services is initially how it started. We opened up in the middle of a pandemic in September of 2020, I believe is when we officially opened the doors. Um, and this is, it offers an alternative to hospitalization for individuals with a mental illness who are experiencing a crisis and, un and are unable to stay in their current living situation. We can provide safe beds, and, which is voluntary, non-medical -med, um, residents, and we are staffed 24-7. We have two staff members on at all times, plus we also have case management services, peer supports, and one of the things that I heard as a theme in tonight's talking as well as in the previous series is talking about collaboration. We work in collaboration also with St. Leonard's, and we do have concurrent disorder case management come in and provide those supports for individuals individuals who are staying at our Brant um, Safe Beds location. And our Brant Safe Beds location is located at 84 Brant Street, just near um, the funeral home and everything like that. So it's easy and accessible across the board for many people, especially those who are in the downtown area, and it's easy to access. One of the other things that we have is the Alternatives Activity Centre, which is a social rec 
program, and it provides a range of social and recreational activities to assist consumers to develop personal resources and or skills. Activity follow up the principles of psychosocial rehabilitation and promotes the empowerment of each consumer through participation in the planning and implementation of activities. Each month, we issue a calendar that's sent out for participants and to the community. And if you're interested, you can call and register to attend. And this is a well-received and highly attended program. And we've been running as much as possible in person, which is something that a lot of our individuals that we support have difficulties doing. If, for, if you're looking at virtual connections, because it isn't always easy to connect virtually and in person, something that we've been able to deliver back in, um, in person fairly regularly. We do road trips. We do you know, various things. It isn't just in one facility either. We help people be able to integrate back into the community in whatever means and comfort levels that they're looking at. So we also have our community support services. And our community support services can include assessments and individual goal setting, information on available resources and linkages to programs and other services. We advocate. We have a lot of people who don't know where to go, how to access services, and that's one of our roles to help advocate to get them connected accordingly. We do provide personal support counseling, not counseling as a whole, as a way of trying to avoid hospitalization, homelessness, incarceration. We do provide some supports in providing life skills teaching. We educate about mental illness. Symptom and medication monitoring management, we, if we aren't doing it ourselves, we'll provide supports and referrals to access to services who can provide those supports. We do provide assistance in finding housing, because that's something that a lot of people are needing. Affordable housing is the piece too. And then we also do have peer supports through our community support services. And this is a self-referral program, self-directed. We don't tell people what to do. We help support them in facilitating whatever they want to do in their recovery. Now, we do have a counseling program. At this time, it is on hold. So before you start doing referrals and rushing for counseling services, we do provide individual and group counseling. We are providing get group aspects, which is all we can deliver right now. And those are um, providing services to people 16 years of age and older living with a serious mental illness. The programs use a client directed approach to assist a person's recovery process and a healing journey. And there's various goals that can be set, whether it be in a group or in an individual basis, and we're here to help provide those supports and goals. As I mentioned, we do have a mental health court support and diversion program, which is a little bit different than the Safe Beds program, but it still is a justice-related program. So we have diversion and court support services for persons with serious mental illnesses in the Brant County and Brantford area. And these services assist individuals in accessing treatment and support services within the community in order to maintain a healthier lifestyle and also to avoid future contact with the criminal justice system. So our post-charge diversion program is for individuals who've been charged with low-risk offenses and are before the court. We provide uh, support for individuals, uh, sorry, the individuals must agree to participate in the program voluntarily. We don't force people to attend. We don't force people to engage in our services. We're there to help them and giving them that power back and make those decisions. So a court support worker will meet with an individual to assess their situation and will make recommendations about what services could be helpful. And diversion contract is signed and given to the Crown Attorney so we can help provide some of those reasons for not being incarcerated. But again, we're, we're there to help support and facilitate this and advocate for an individual. We do provide in, um, consultation. Individuals who are not deemed suitable for diversion may consult with a court support worker around bail, probation, and other release plans. We can also provide consultation and advice for many of the given to the lawyers on cases referred for disposition. And we can provide some educational pieces. We can inform regarding consumers' issues, mental illness, and or the mental health system is available for consumers and family members, service providers, and court personnel. We're there to help if we can, we can connect you. If we don't have the answer, we can help find the answer. 
So in our justice bed, we do have a little, you know, asterisk next to it. We have something called the crisis stabilization bed. So it's located in Simcoe, but we have two beds here in Brantford. So we have an eight bed program with the um, BSB is what it's called, the Brant Safe Beds. Out of those eight beds, two of them are crisis stabilization. So the difference between the two is our BSB, the justice referral ones, those are referrals that would come in from police or hospital. And we provide eight bed, or sorry, six bed for justice. That is an up to a 30 day stay that somebody would need those additional crisis services if it's a justice referral. If somebody does a self-referral, and that's the crisis stabilization bed, and we have a, a six bed program in Simcoe, and then two beds that we have here in Brantford, those are seven day, up to a seven day stay, and as a self-referral piece. Again, it's for somebody who's in a situation wherever they're housed, they do not feel safe where they're at, and they need to provide or find some services to help them while they're in crisis to, to stabilize, to get regulated so that they can go back and focus on goals that they need to help with maintaining their abilities. We also do have supportive housing, and if you guys might recognize this, this is actually Phoenix Place. We don't own the building. We provide supports for people that live in there, and we have a, a, quite a few units that we provide supports. We also have Lions Ave, and we do offer a rent supplement program, and our services do include regular tenant meetings, group activities through alternatives, activity center, peer supports if, if somebody would like a peer support. And we do have community support services and they're offered to all tenants in supportive housing. We do have housing workers that work specifically with those people that have identified they want supports. We also have vocational support services. Those vocational support services is to provide to individuals who have mental health concerns and it assists individuals to obtain and sustain employment, education or volunteer opportunities, whatever a person identifies that they want to do to contribute back into the community. We have a program called Works For Me and then another program for a sustainable employment initiative and they're available to help clients establish and pursue their vocational goals using psychosocial rehabilitation and recovery approach. Our services do include skills assessment and job readiness, skill development and planning, identification of employment and goals, resume and cover letter uh, preparation, job search strategy, strategies, interview skills, supported job search, educational and, edu and volunteer opportunities, and information and referral. We can provide those supports to people as they're looking for additional pieces in their recovery and their journey. Another piece that we offer is family support, and I think that this is going to be a point where it would come into if you're working with somebody or you have a family member that's dealing with a mental health issue or a mental health challenge and you're not sure how to be able to help provide the support. So you're looking for somebody who has a support that you are, that you're looking for yourself. This is where we would provide those supports. We have a family support program. We can provide information about coping with mental health concerns in the family. We do assistance locating services and supports. And we can provide education and support groups. We have NAMI, which is our family to family education support program. It's an eight week course. I have flyers at the back and the course itself teaches about mental illness and mental health challenges and how to be able to build your own boundaries and all these other things that we need in our own toolboxes to help support a loved one who has a mental health concern. Families Caring and Family Sharing is a support group held once a month that allows individuals to seek the supports and get the supports from people who are dealing with similar situations. And then we also have a survivors of suicide loss bereavement support group. Again, it's a once a month support group for people to be able to get together right now virtually to provide those supports and they all have commonalities and commonalities very much like peer support and connecting with people who have that lived experience or have that common, common experience can help create a huge support system in being able to help ourselves as family members go and provide the supports that we need for our other family members with mental health and know that we're not alone and that's the big piece. 
We're not alone as family members working and living with, loving somebody who has a mental health or has attempted suicide or any of those things. These are all things that we can provide supports for. So then my role in mental health promotion is not only do I do this, but I also provide information, workshops, conferences. We just had a lovely one in, uh, in October um, in the Haldeman Norfolk area. We provide professional development and training. We promote campaigns on topics related to mental health through events and activities. You might see us at the pole occasionally at Harmony Square or in Paris. And we also do fundraising events. We provide awareness campaigns, everything that we possibly can to get the idea of talking about mental health, addictions, all that sort of stuff is okay to talk about. We don't want to have that stigma in there as soon as you hear mental health, because we all have mental health, whether it be good or bad, but we all have it. And that's all I have. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, next we have another familiar face from our Q&A panel. I'd like to welcome up Charlotte Branton. Uh, Charlotte is a registered psychotherapist from Woodview Mental Health and Autism Services. So please welcome Charlotte. Thank you. Um, I'm just here to talk about, about the services we have available to youth. Woodview Mental Health and Autism Service supports individuals between the ages of 0 to 18 facing mental health challenges and or living with autism and their families. We are an accredited and registered charitable organization that serves three regions, Brant, Halton and Hamilton, and we are the lead agency for children's mental health in Brant. We're made up of an amazing team of social workers, psychotherapists, child youth workers, autism specialists, and consulting professionals. In our mental health programs, we offer a number of different treatment options. We have our office-based counseling, which includes individual counseling, family counseling, group counseling programs such as the Triple P Parenting and Anxiety Groups, our parent education and support, and case management. We have intensive services, which is more non-traditional counseling offered outside of the office environment, which supports children, youth, and families in their home schools and communities. We have the SNAP program, that is the Stop Now and Plan program. This is offered to children from ages of 6 to 11 years old and their families. This is an evidence-based program designed to help children struggling with behavioral issues and to give their parents strategies. This is offered in partnership with Six Nations Child and Family Services. We have, the youth, we have the Youth Justice Program, which offers assessment and treatment to youth who are referred through youth justice system. Any youth on probation can access this program with a referral from their probation officer. We have TAPSI. This is the Arson Prevention Program for Children, which is offered in partnership with the Brantford and Brant County Fire Departments. In TAPC, the fire department offers fire education and an in-home safety check, while the Woodview clinician conducts clinical risk assessment and offers the family strategies to deal with the youth or child's fire setting behavior. We have two day treatment classrooms. Um, day treatment classrooms are mental health programs that also have an academic component. We have our adolescent day treatment, which serves youth age 13 to 18 years, and it's located at Pauline Johnson School. And we have our elementary day treatment program, which is students in grades six to eight, and that is located at James Hilliard School. To make referrals to any of these Woodview mental health programs, you can call our office directly, and you're given an intake appointment. Next, you will meet with a clinician for what we call the choice appointment. At this appointment, we work collaboratively with you to determine which of these programs would be the best fit for you and your family. Another way to access service through Woodview is our brief clinic. This is a single session that is offered without the need of a referral or an intake. 
It is a solution-focused counseling session which gives clients an opportunity to meet with a clinician and to be able to take away some strategies and resources. We also have our drop, youth drop-in. It's located in Harmony Square. It is at our community hub, and we have partnerships with the Brant County Health Unit, the Wesley Youth Outreach Workers, the Boys and Girls Club, and Brant Paramedics. It's a safe space for youth 12 to 18 to come hang out, eat some food, play games, and do activities. The drop-in runs Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 5 to 7. Tuesday is our 2SL, GBTQ+, and Allies group. Thursday or Friday are open groups. Uh, there's no cost and no referral needed. It's an open group. Uh, and we have our autism services. So Brantford Autism Services offers intensive behavior intervention therapy, family skills development, social skills groups, webinars, and in-center services. To access these programs, you can call the center directly. Uh, lastly, as... Uh, it was mentioned a couple times we have Preventure, which is a new and exciting program that Woodview has begun. Preventure is an evidence-based prevention program that uses personality-focused interventions to promote mental health and to delay substance use among teens. Preventure was tested in multiple randomized control trials throughout the globe, producing solid scientific results showing that it has strong effect on delaying alcohol and substance use and a positive effect on several mental health issues that may co-occur with substance misuse. It is recognized as an evidence-based program by several authorities. So how it works, um, we will meet with the youth and using the substance use risk profile questionnaire, we identify the personality type the youth most align with by the category. So those categories are hopelessness, anxiety sensitivity, impulsivity, and sensation seeking. The youth will then attend two 90-minute personality targeted workshops, which are led by trained facilitators. The sessions follow a workbook and identify goals and risks, factors and strategies that are most relevant to the personality and coping style. So in this past year, we have run three sessions. We did one with the Why Not Youth, one with our Woodview ADT program, and one with our Harmony Square drop-in youth. And we are really looking forward to the new year where we're going to be able to hopefully run some more groups. Um, I do have a copy of a couple of the workbooks that we use over at my back table, if anyone would like to take a look at it, um, or if anyone has any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, we have our last community representative speaking tonight. I'd like to welcome up Julie Smith. Uh, Julie is the program manager for mental health um, and addictions at St. Leonard's. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, as Alyssa said, my name's Julie. I'm a manager within our addictions and mental health sector. Um, primarily focusing on the concurrent disorders outpatient program is what's under my portfolio, but I'm here to talk to you a bit about some of our services, most specifically in addictions and mental health, um, but I'll cover a little bit more than that. So we're a not-for-profit charity. Um, we've been around um, since 1968, so it's been a while. Um, we have multiple locations in Brantford, Brant, and Haldeman counties, and we're accredited in children's mental health and addictions and mental health through the Canadian Centre for Accreditation. Um, we are broken into four separate sectors, so addictions and mental health, which I'll dive in a little deeper, uh, housing, um, as some of our um, others here have talked about some of our services there, justice and employment. So there's lots to share and only five or ten minutes, so um, I won't be able to cover all of it, but there are uh, components of, pr of programs within all sectors that would be helpful to assist people struggling with uh, addictions and mental health, and we often work collaboratively together within our own organization. Okay, so I'm going to talk, as I said, more specifically about the addictions and mental health services. And so I'll start with our crisis service continuum. So within our crisis services, we have immediate telephone crisis counseling, a mental health walk-in clinic. We have a community outreach and support team called our COAST team. And we have our MCURT team, the mobile crisis rapid response team. 
So our crisis line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are open throughout all of the holidays and, and stats. Um, supporting, we basically support people experiencing mental health distress or situational crisis. Um, I, we often try to veer from the word crisis because that, that's dependent on the individual. So um, whatever the individual is experiencing and, and deem as crisis, we're there to support them. We also provide some support to professionals who need guidance on where to connect with people. We offer safety planning, coping strategies, connection to ongoing services and system navigation. So we do have a local number and a 1866 number as well. The walk-in clinic, um, we have are providing support um, at our 225 Fairview location and as well into, in Paris. Um, supporting individuals experiencing, again, crisis as I talked about, brief solution-focused counseling, the same um, services are being supported in the crisis line, um, but on a walk-in basis. Um, I've put here crisis, call the crisis line for more information because we are currently going to be expanding our hours. So it's been ever-changing since we are coming out of the pandemic. Um, so our website will have current information or you can call the crisis line to access that. Um, the MCURT team, so individuals that come in contact with police where mental health is an identified concern. Um, this is response to 911 calls in partnership with Brantford Police and the Brant County OPP. Um, providing risk assessment, safety planning, de-escalation, and connection to ongoing services. So the only way to access this is by calling 911. So it would be a situation that would, you would need police and uh, if, if the situation was involving someone struggling with mental health and substance use, then, um, and the MCURT team was available because they're not 24-7, um, they would dispatch them to come and assist. The crisis uh, outreach and support team, the COAST team, um, is indiv supports individuals of all ages or families experiencing mental health addiction or a concurrent disorder, so mental health and substance use co-occurring. COAST is short term, so it's up to three, sometimes three to five sessions, I'll say, um, focusing on stabilization, increasing functioning of people in crisis, and connecting to ongoing supports. So it's not an immediate response like a 911 response, but it is a response that we strive to respond to within 48 hours. So it's not, like I said, not 911, but it's still urgent enough that you need some uh, support in the next couple of days. So referrals can be made, you can make a referral, a professional can make a referral, and that's simply by calling the crisis line, and we often encourage that, because um, the crisis counselor can offer some immediate support, um, and also assist with making that referral. It can also be accessed on our uh, website as well. Um, concurrent disorder outpatient services is um, under me, and so in that program we offer office-based um, counseling support um, in, and in that um, intake assessment, um, individual and group counseling, um, treatment planning, referrals to, I'm probably getting into the next slide, but that's okay, and uh, connection to uh, referrals to day and residential treatment. Uh, we also have uh, our partner in our uh, RAM clinic, and we also have a harm reduction program. So as I started to say, in our concurrent disorder program, we provide services to individuals 12 years and up, um, as well as support for family or loved ones who are supporting an individual struggling with substance use or a concurrent disorder. So as I said, assessment and treatment planning, um, individualized support plans and referral, uh, referrals to more intensive services. Um, our focus is, uh, our approach is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational intervening stages of change, and DBT skills. There, there is a list of group supports that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we offer, which I'm not going to go into, but I can certainly provide some more information at the back table, um, as well as peer support. We also have an art therapist on our team who does individual and group work. Um, we have relapse management groups and DBT skills groups and do outreach um, in several different locations, and some are mentioned today. Um, crisis safe beds. We do outreach and have a partnership with uh, probation and parole. Um, high schools, as Jackie had mentioned. Um, 
really uh, removing the barriers for people to access services. I will say too, um, we continue to offer services virtual and uh, by phone, um, as well as in person. So based on um, client preference, uh, with the pandemic, there have been many clients who've asked for us or inquired, are we gonna continue um, with some of those options? And of course we are. Um, we do encourage the, um, in person, um, but again, we don't want to be limiting for someone who maybe has, has barriers to coming in. Um, and to access uh, this service, it's simply by calling the number there. We provide um, evening hour appointments um, and a same day intake is often available, meaning an individual can call. Our office opens up at 8.30 and get an intake later on that day. If they have to be full, then it's simply calling back the next day. If there are barriers to doing that, then we can offer a scheduled appointment. So really trying to get people um, in, in the door as quickly as possible. Um, the Rapid Access Addiction Medicine Clinic. So we are one of, I think, five partners that um, make up the RAM Clinic. And so we provide our concurrent disorder our counseling on site there as part of that multidisciplinary team. We have locations in Dunville, Simcoe, and Brantford. Um, and, and, and also have uh, launched the digital front door, which allows virtual access for people that may be in, um, unable to access the clinic in person or in remote, more remote areas. Um, as mentioned, harm reduction, we have a harm reduction program, so we're distributing um, safe use supplies in naloxone. Um, we have two locations, one at a 225 Fairview location and uh, one at 133 Algon. Um, and at each of those locations, we do have a drop box that's available 24 seven for any used um, syringes or harm reduction supplies. Um, and lastly, I'll jump into our withdrawal management and treatment services, which is broken into um, withdrawal management, day treatment and residential. Um, in our residential program, services ages 16 and up um, who require uh, residential support for safe withdrawal from substances. Um, to access that program, it's simply calling. Um, you don't need a referral. Um, you can call, an individual can call and see if there's a bed available. They'll walk them through a screening and intake process. If by chance um, we are full, then they'll look to support the individual in connecting with other withdrawal management services in the surrounding area. Obviously, they can go on a wait list and um, go from there. Um, day treatment, um, again, the same age range. It's a five-week program. It, is, it goes along with the residential program. So while residential treatment is going on, people can also attend it on a day, treat, day, day treatment basis. So we're, they're not staying there, but they're attending the programming during the day and going home, while others are living there during the five-week um, program. Um, individuals are assessed through the concurrent disorder outpatient program, so that's the point of access, um, is going through the assessment process to determine if that level of service is needed. Um, and that's not a St. Leonard's process, that's a provincial process um, to access residential services provincially. And the residential program, as I already alluded to, is a five-week group program. Um, that offers some one-to-one -one individual counseling as well. So individuals would attend primarily group counseling during the day. They would be connected to a concurrent disorder clinician where they'd have individual um, weekly appointments while they stay there. Um, upon discharge, if they're living in our area, they would be connected back up to outpatient treatment because we know that um, that relapse as part of the process and so connecting and, and continuing the work that they've done in residential on an outpatient basis is key. Um, and yeah, like I said, accessing that through the, the CD or the concurrent disorder outpatient program. Really no wrong door. The first step is to call the, the Fairview office and that's really your first point of access. If an individual accesses through crisis, they'll connect that individual if that's what they need as well. And that's all. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them afterwards. Again, there's lots of more detail, but uh, not enough time. Thank you.
Thank you, Julie. And I'd just like to say thank you to all of our community representatives speaking here tonight. It's, it's phenomenal to know that these community supports and resources are here locally. And it's, it's just a great, and collaboration, I think, is our, our theme word for tonight. So I, I love that. Um, to conclude our night, I'd like to welcome back uh, Maria Estrada, our mental health advocate and living experience expert. Maria has shared with us her dynamic journey and provided empowering knowledge and skills of how to overcome overcome life obstacles, navigate the system, and be resilient to be the strongest person um, that we can be. So thank you, Maria, for coming back tonight and bringing light to the purpose of the mini-series and what we've learned throughout the session. So warm welcome to Maria. I'm still short. <laughs> Um, thank you so much again for having me. Um, to the community partners, I really appreciate your involvement. Um, as a person that has used a lot of services in my journey um, as a teenager and continue to do so, I value the relationship that we have with our partners. And also as a professional, I also applaud that the community partners are here tonight to show that to help the young people who are struggling with mental health and or substance use, we do come together as a community to uh, provide a safety net and to remember that they're not alone and none of you are alone. So I appreciate that very much. I'm really sad that it's the last day. I was telling Rachel that and um, I look forward to always coming here and, and spending the evening with you and um, exchanging information and knowledge. So I will definitely be missing this every, um, well not every Wednesday, every couple of Wednesdays. Um, so thank you for having me. I also want to thank you for being here tonight. I've always said that throughout the series that I do admire that you are here. I wish that I had my family, specifically my mom, uh, be here uh, to learn about how she can support me better. And I think that it would have made a huge difference for me in my journey to have uh, some sort of family representation um, and willingness to learn about what I was struggling with and what I continue to struggle with. So I wanna thank you for being here. I also want to leave you with a couple of things um, that we've learned throughout the series is that one, recovery is a journey, not a destination. And if I had the magic pill or potion or anything to solve everybody's problems, I will be that first one to try it out and let you know. Um, but what I do know is that life is a journey and as much as I would love to get to a destination of rainbows and sunshines and I would be magically cured, um, that's not the case. But I do embrace everything that has happened to me and although I wouldn't do it again, I've learned from the things that I've experienced and I bring that back to everybody that's here and I appreciate you listening and supporting uh, my journey. Also being mindful that relapse is a part of recovery. And for most journeys, and for a lot of people, they've had to have had some sort of relapse in their journey to become the best version of themselves. And that was my story for a long time. I've had a lot of relapses to really figure out what worked for me, what didn't work for me, what I can rely on my community to, to help me achieve um, a life worth living. And it takes time. Like I've said, I have been um, in therapy for over a decade. I will continue to go to therapy. Um, I am proud to say that I do go to therapy because I'm trying to live the best version of me and a life worth living. As we learn throughout the series, we know that there's a continuum of uh, change and specifically with addiction. And there is no one, two, three step. It's one, five, six, one again, two, three, and it always changes and that's okay. And for people that have a hard time really understanding what others are going through, um, it's, it's hard to have that tangible piece for a lot of people. And with mental health, you can't see it. And it's not really tangible and it's really hard to understand. And as I shared um, in my last series about empathy and coming from that compassion state, 
And it's okay not to know the answers. I don't have a lot of the answers a lot of the time, but I welcome everybody with open arms and open ears and just listen to what they're going through. I don't need to fix people. They're not broken and I want you to remember that. Yes, it may feel like their life is falling apart and everything's shattering, but they're not broken. I want you to think about it as a puzzle piece. They just lost a lot of puzzle pieces along their journey and it's an honor that you get to help them find it. And it takes a long time and I'm still trying to find my own puzzle pieces, but I, I continue to do so. And I also have to remind myself that I'm not broken. And it's okay to remind yourself of that. And it's okay to tell the people that you're supporting that, hey, you're not broken. You're just missing a, a bunch of puzzle pieces and that's okay because I know that you came with a beautiful picture. Let me help you find those puzzle pieces. Coming from that empathy and compassion piece that I hope that we all learn today. And I know for myself, I continue to learn from all these experiences. I want to share what a lot of the community partners mentioned that they have the program as peer support. Um, and that's how I started my career and I wish I had that when I was young because I think that it would have been really beneficial. Um, if you don't know what peer support is, it's somebody that has a similar lived experience supporting another person that has lived experience who's in a journey of recovery and who's reached a state of recovery and stability that's able to share that with somebody else. And that's what, I, what I've done for most of my career was peer support. I would come into a meeting with a young person and sit with them as human beings as they tell me their struggles and I'm able to say, yeah, man, been there, done that. This is what I did. Maybe we can figure this out. And I know for a lot of the young people that I support, they look at me and they're like, man, like it's really good that I'm talking to somebody that has lived experience that's not judging me because you've done the things that I've done. And, and I wish I, I had had that when I was growing up. Peer support was not necessarily a thing yet, um, especially in, in Halton region. And I wish that I had somebody that would have said, yeah, Maria, like I also f***ed up multiple times. You're okay, right? And, and to take that, that shame away from me would have been really helpful. Um, AA was the first um, program to start peer support where you're all sitting in, in a group sharing your own lived experience about um, alcoholism. And we transfer that into the mental health and addiction system. So if there is one thing that I push, and not just because um, I used to be a peer support worker, but to explore those peer support programs, along with the other um, clinical supports as well. It's really beneficial for people to feel like they're sitting with somebody that really understands what they're going through because they've done that and they've gone through it and they have come through the other side and they can hold their hand and say, we got this. Just like the empathy versus sympathy that we saw in the last video. There's a lot of things that I've learned just being here and I find it very therapeutic to even just retell my story and share. Um, and I, I want to thank you for that. I also acknowledge that you being here it gives me pleasure and privilege to be part of your journeys and to everybody that I've talked to and they have shared you know, who they're supporting or what they're struggling with. I really appreciate your vulnerability and ability to share that with me because I do treasure that and I honor that tremendously. I hope that you learn that you're definitely not alone. You have a community that is supporting you, even the school board, which is fantastic. I know that uh, for myself as a, as a young person in high school, um, I'm pretty sure that's why I graduated because my school really supported me in my mental health and they didn't judge me for it, which is something that um, was rare for me, especially in the education system. So I do want to thank the, the school boards for being here because it does make a difference, especially with the young people spending eight hours in schools. Um, and if they're struggling to know that um, a guidance counselor or a social worker or a child and youth worker is there to support them. So with that being said, I am sad to end this. I wish I could talk here forever. I, it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and 
please have some time to go through uh, the other communities that are here and to learn and get some resources. And um, knowledge is power. And uh, make sure that you take that all in and hopefully um, you're able to support yourselves and your loved ones. So thank you so much. Thank you for everybody that's online. I know this, this isn't my good side, but that's okay. Um, and, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Maria. I, I did have a slide with your name, so wrong way. So sorry, I, I forgot to flip that there. <laughs> um, your words throughout all the sessions have been so valuable, and that's one of my favorite sayings: "Knowledge is power." So I truly believe that, and I hope everyone can can feel that too. And that's that's the purpose of being here tonight, and being here throughout all four sessions is gaining that knowledge and skills, those skills to be powerful and to have the education, so we can educate our youth and provide those supports um, for them in the community. I just want to say thank you to our planning committee um, on the mini-series here for bringing everything together. We've been working hard on this um, since the spring, and we've done a great job bringing this um, every, every session. Thank you to all of our various panelists from the, the Q&A panel, the different sessions, our marketplace vendors. It's been great to have you out um, and having all this dedication and passion to supporting the community. A big huge shout out too to our, our tech team, uh, Paul and Rogers here. Um, I'd be shouting if I didn't have this set up, so thank you for that. And um, a special thank you to Rogers too, because they're, they're not just here t for fun. Um, they're, they're filming and producing each session. Um, and it, right now we do have sessions available to view again on their website, their YouTube channel, and it's on Channel TV. Um, so they will be recurring um, and they're produced there now. The link to access them is in the resource guide there. So, so thank you, Rogers, for being here for that. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and participating in the Drugs and Youth mini-series. Without you, we just have all this stuff and, and no one to spread, spread the words with. So I really pre appreciate you all being here and seeing the familiar faces each session. has been great. Um, and to all of our virtual participants, too, um, tuning in from home. And a big huge thank you um, to Maria for being here every session. Um, like I said, your words are just so valuable. And you've brought a great dynamic to the mini-series. I know we all have learned a lot and, and seen things from a different perspective. And I know Dr. Tara Bruno isn't here tonight, um, but a huge thank you to her too for developing all the content and taking her time um, to help plan and present for us too. She's just a wealth of knowledge and such a great person. So thank you both for for bringing it to light. So that concludes our mini series here. And my final kind of word here is it's misleading to think that we will ever eliminate substance use. So thank you for being here as an effective way to delay use, minimize the harms, and to reconnect our youth. There's no blaming, no shaming. It's just listening, learning, and supporting. So thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.